I just don't understand how the players think this is okay and why the coaches think it's okay. Yeah, I actually think that's a really strong argument that Fnatic are the best team in the LEC right now. You know, there are people like on every team a part of this like match fixing ring. Oh, thanks, Ginny. Yeah, okay. Go for them. Right, yeah, I'll, see you, I'll see you later. Hello and welcome to the jungle. I'm Ginny, joined with Medic, Broxa, and Cubby to discuss everything and anything related to League of Legends. Starting off with the state of Cloud9 and if they are the W word, but also this wild thing of an entire region match fixing. Make sure that you guys stick around because we're also going to be answering your questions. Drop them down below if you have anything you want us to answer in the future. But without further ado, let's jump straight into things and start talking about Quickshot. Uh, yeah, uh, so Quickshot this week announced that he's no longer part of the LEC. Uh, I'm going to read part of his tweet just so we, we have his official wording on it. I'm officially a freelancer and no longer employed by Riot Games. I'm proud of the part I've played in the LEC over the years, but I'm ready to take on new projects. In anticipation of people asking, I don't expect to be on the LEC broadcast. I think the obviously it, lots of people are going to have their own suppositions and hypotheticals around it. I'm much more interested in how big of a loss it is for the LEC. Obviously, mm -hmm. Quickshot's a very good friend of mine. Um... But he was such a stalwart. He's been around in the LEC for 10 years and to lose him and to lose his uh, infectious personality and the general <laughs> background stuff he did is, uh, I think, actually a real kick in the teeth just for the LEC and, and for Riot Games as a whole. Uh, he brought me into casting and I know there's a lot of people who are currently casting the LEC that wouldn't be around without quick shot. So, uh, yeah, sad to see him go. Yeah. Definitely one of those people as well. Um, I met him first when I did my first ever league gig, and that was in LEC Finals in Montpellier. And he introduced me to the talent manager, and he's like, she's good. Uh, we need to hire her. And I was really looking forward to, you know, one day getting to work together with Quickshot, because he was very kind and like a father figure in the very short amount of time that I did know him. So, yeah, I, I, I'm one of those people too. I remember... Uh one year, I think it was 2018, um, I was messaging a bit with, with Quickshot before a, a big final, and I caught him really off guard, because what he didn't realize is that I could go back in my Facebook messaging history, <laughs> and I found a message I had sent to him in like 2013. Wow. It feels so long ago now, where I was like, hey, Quickshot, you're my favorite caster. I'm your biggest fan. Could you please play an ARAM with me? <laughs> like, no joke. <laughs> that, that message actually exists. I could even find it now. But <laughs> That's know, cute. That was, that was a great moment. But then, obviously, later I, I ended up joining um, the broadcast team. And I think for, for most of us newer people on the team, he would generally be the guy that... Uh, introduces you to everything that makes sure uh, that you feel welcome and, and that you, uh, you know, just feel at home in the LEC, really. And it's definitely going to be a big loss for, for everybody not having him around. Uh, like Medic said, not even just not having his infectious humor. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's the, the tough situation we're in, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I know of, like even from the other side of the pond, like, the my fandom goes back to the early days of you know season two um and like immediately like season three i was watching lcs and then the eu lcs and he was there and i think that I mean, one of the coolest parts about you know broadcasting and being a broadcaster is that if you're good you can do it for a lot of years and you earn the trust of the audience over those years and bookshot mm -hmm. had that to the degree where like i think it was really big like when eu lcs rebranded to lec i know that uh I don't know exactly what year he was kind of the creative director for you guys, but like there was a lot of conversation as the LCS was kind of not developing as a product. Like, you know, they need someone like Quickshot, right? Like they need someone to step in and like really be the head honcho and like be the big, you know, driving force behind everything. Um, I feel like, you know, you guys would know like directly, especially you, Medic, like being a part of the broadcast for a while, like the impact that you had on kind of how the LEC developed as a product, but um and you're not only losing someone that goes back to like almost day one but also had a major impact like positively for what the product was and i think that that sucks in in both aspects and he was talented enough to be both uh so yeah i know you guys are feeling it and that side of the pond but uh always really respected his work over here and uh yeah it sucks to see him go like this 
Yeah, it definitely does. Um, I'm going to clear up a couple of misconceptions just because I do see them bandied around a little bit. Um, the, the one was that like, Quickshot was just managing everyone from behind the scenes while he was on this break. Uh, like, he hasn't been my manager for like three years. Uh, he, mm -hmm. Nicole came in a year and a half ago. Uh, and before that, I think Quickshot had stepped down. So he had still obviously been working on the LAC and working really hard, but he hasn't uh, been directly anyone's manager for a little while uh and then also the creative director thing like he was a key part of the lec but as far as i remember he wasn't like the lead creative director it was much more of a collaborative effort and um it, it came from people like dirk and uh kevin and john depper who are producers and then from even from above them as well um he he was definitely an integral part of it and i don't want to take any of any of that away from him but yeah. he wasn't like the a creative lead on the whole thing. He didn't make it from the ground up. Um, but he did do a lot of stuff. Like, he was the first play-by-play -play that pushed for everyone's usability names, right? The guy was a color caster. Everyone hated him, honestly, when he started as a color caster. And then he moved into play-by-play, -play, told himself he was just going to learn all the ability names because Joe Miller and D-Man didn't know them. So that was, like, why all... Not why all play-by-plays do it, but he was definitely the inspiration for a lot of us. Uh... He was a huge part of pushing for talent to have more of a voice in the LEC as well. Uh, even during like the prepo and the deficio days, like he, he would be always pushing people to to just be more of a brand themselves, um, which was uh, it's just a big inspiration. And it's strange to look back on those days now and look at how many people we've lost, like uh, just for the LEC. You know, Joe Miller, D-Man are gone, Pyro and Stress are gone. Uh, we lost Frosk, uh, and then alongside that, really only shocks remains from like the the initial core yeah. talent. I mean, JCap was there as well, uh, like right at the start. So in the LCS as well, very similarly, like Freak's gone, Zyrene's gone. You have Kobe, Azale. I'm not going to list everyone, obviously. And obviously, apologies if I miss anyone's names here. It's not that you know you've been overlooked. It's just I haven't written this down, so I'm just it's off the dome. Uh, but yeah, you have like Kobe, Azale, Jat, and Flowers from the original core talent there. Um, and it does feel like the changing of the guard is a strange sort of concept because I'm one of the oldest casters on the LEC now, and I still feel like a baby. Like I still ve feel very new to the whole thing. So. Yeah, it's super strange. Uh, I'm going to miss him a lot. And uh, hopefully he, he does well in whatever's next. It, it's funny, right, how fast everything has changed over the yeah. years. Because in, in some ways now, even I am considered a sort of veteran when working for the LEC. Yeah, exactly. And it feels like yesterday that I was still playing, right? But that's esports. It's, it's crazy and volatile and everything changes really, really rapidly. So I guess we're just going to... Fasten our seatbelts and, and see what comes along the way. Yeah, absolutely. I think you guys are talking about, you know, changing of the guard and at least this weekend on the LEC. Why'd you take quick shot spot, Ginny? Huh? Whoa, Why'd you whoa, kick him out? Play by play. Yo, relax. What the fuck, Ginny? Uh, yo, I know, I know you in your mean? contract it says I will not work with quick shot. I know it. No, it's not. I, I wanted that in my contract. I wanted <laughs> to work with him. Um, no, I think, I think like, obviously, you're talking about, like, changing uh, of the guard and, like, new people coming in. And, like, this week on the LEC, particularly on Monday, like, from my perspective, it's like I was hosting and then Aragon and Jamada were analysts and we're all, like, 25-year-old little shits who, you know, are just starting um, their esports career and I think for us like from my perspective like we're very lucky that we get to work with the likes of yourself and Vetti and Dracos and Lore I think Lore especially has helped has had for me personally a really big impact on my career but working with people who have so many years of experience that I think that is a, not having the ability to do that is a very big loss um, regardless of how long you have been in the game like these household names that you dropped and that are unfortunately um, not with us in terms of the live broadcast anymore. That is a really uh, a, a resource that you can't put a price on. That's now gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean mm -hmm. it is right. Like I, I, it's mm -hmm. strange to see how quickly people churn out of esports. I mean, it, it's very similar generally in gaming. Like you, you see how quickly people are turned over in companies, and you obviously there's a lot of firings going on at the moment as well. But there are sports broadcasters I've listened to from when I was born until now, and they're still casting football games. And like there are baseball commentators that I know their voices because I've seen so many clips of them over the years, right? Like, and I don't watch any baseball, but they're these like iconic figures because uh, yeah. I think in baseball you have like the stadium commentators, don't you? Like you have the home and away commentators sometimes. Yep. 
the same in basketball, right? But for those fans, that is the voice of their team. And it's strange to think that we're kind of losing some of the voices of the LEC. And I'm honored, like, people talk about me in the same breath as Quickshot. And that's absurd to me, right? I don't see myself like that at all. But it is strange how quickly we've lost a lot of those voices. Like, it feels like anything more than 10 years is truly an aberration in esports now. Yeah, I, I mean... I understand it from like the perspective of losing those voices because, as I said, it's a it's an invaluable resource. But also at the same time, it's like we're we're getting new people that are oh, yeah. joining, like, and they're I also love making the new a mark. I, like I'm not trying to I'm not oh, trying to put trying them to be down nice at all. Like, Thank you. Um, That's you know, new. most yeah. of the new people, I love them, and I think it's great to have them like progress. <laughs> but what I, I'd love to see like you know, quick shot here or like the the old people here for another five years, and yeah. then the new voices start to take over, and then that you have new voices coming in. Sometimes it does feel a little bit like. I, no offense, Ginny, but you haven't had a lot of time, right? You haven't no, had not, the not training taken. and the development it's that true. everyone else has had. Like, I w for the first year and a half I was in the LEC, I didn't go to a single roadshow because I just wasn't good enough because I hadn't been trained up enough. But now the churn means that people get thrust into the deep end very quickly and it's sink or swim. Mm -hmm. And we see yeah. the amount of people that pop onto the LEC now that you don't see back because that the the stress and the, the weight of expectation on you is so high. The LCS is a great example of it as well with play-by-plays, right? Raph is a good play-by-play. -play. Latigris, maybe with a couple of years, could have progressed into like a great play-by-play. -play. Uh, who else has been on there? De 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 Dera Crew? Dera Rooks? Dera Rooks, yeah. He's one Dasarux. of my teammates. Yeah, he, yeah he, he's, a he's a great play-by-play -play yeah. as well. But I, like, he's where good I voice. was a year before I was ready for like a big LEC game. But I was on yeah. the LEC for that year because I had the time and I was given the patience to actually progress. You don't get that anymore. You get a split at most to really show that you're good enough and if you're a not good days. enough you, yeah maybe sometimes like yeah a split is like five show days at most for most of mm -hmm. the new people and you just yeah. don't get the time to progress and to grow and part of that is audience expectation as well like the product has grown into this massive like undertaking and you have to be good enough to be on it but part of it as well is the churn of everyone else you know people are just moving through so quickly that you get your shot, and if you're not good enough, we'll find someone else who's worked in the EOLs for a couple of years and put them in. I mean, we can say it's a well-oiled machine, um, but also at the same time, I think a couple more days per split would also be really nice because it does yeah. give you that opportunity to be trained because it's like, you know, you're going to be put on the desk or you're going to be put on a cast, and it's like, you got one cast, you got one desk, and if you shit the bed, goodbye. And it's also um, the time you have outside yeah. of that. Sorry, I'm... I, I, you've got me down on the training of new casters route and I'm like, I, uh -oh. it frustrates me no end time, because I, I have pushed for quite a few years to be like, hey, let me train new casters. Give me some time with the EME Masters guys. Let me take some time with them once a week. We'll sit, we'll watch some VODs and we'll train them up and you can give them actually like dedicated time where they can learn and improve. And as much as like an initialized can reach out to me and be like, hey, can you do a VOD review for me? That's once every three months or so, right? Like every now and again, you get input. When I was starting off on the LEC, I was on Challenger Series every week for about eight months, like with the, you know, the usual breaks in between. And every day, the day before, I would go into the LEC studio and I'd have Crepo and I'd have Deficio and I'd have Dracos and I'd have Quickshot there and we'd talk about casting. And you just don't get that anymore. You don't get that like yeah. nuanced discussion around things. Even I now, like I, I struggle with improving my cast because up until a couple of weeks ago, we didn't have regular caster meetings in the LEC. You didn't have mm -hmm. that time to actually discuss the nuance of casting because it is an incredibly nuanced skill to be able to talk for 40 minutes without sounding stupid. And I yeah. struggle with it like still to this day. Yeah, I, uh, something like I'm kind of jealous of like in past eras, you know, like casters would be in the office. And, you know, you would have times where it would be like, hey, you know, like, let's go over these games. You're like, hey, this is popping up in solo queue. Like, let's put our heads together and test it out and see what it's like. Right. Uh, and I feel like the like, you know, the eras of kind of the behind the scenes for casting, like it, at one point, a lot of these guys were full time with Riot and like the just being in the building together. There's definitely a lot of value in that because this is a very niche craft. And so we can only really help each other, you know. Um, what you guys mean casters start the game <laughs> yeah yeah that's yeah, all yeah. i see in chat that's, that's literally all i see in chat was the best it's when the lec was the best when we were all in the office five day, yeah. four days a week with the show and we could just sit there and even if it felt like you had nothing to do someone would come up to you and be like hey i've got this cold open idea what do you think and you just ideate like 2019 i think was peak lec 
obviously helps that you know g2 were playing really well as well but in terms of what we were putting out in term, like as a as a broadcast and as a develop like the, the cutting edge of broadcasting was lec 2019 for the lec obviously other broadcasts do a great job now but you just don't get that time anymore and it, it, it kind of sucks i'm gonna be honest yep, yep. And transition times also make that a little bit more yeah. difficult but on the topic of teams playing well um, I want to start off with the LCS particularly and C9. Um, Kabi, this one is definitely going to be your topic because last week we voted C9 100 Thieves as the match of the week. Do you feel like it delivered? No. Uh, <laughs> best of five sucked. <laughs> it, was okay. beat, it was an absolute beatdown. Um, I mean, it delivered if you're a C9 fan. You just got to kind of wake up by a... Watch your team smash and then you know, just go about your day. It was a short, it was a real short series. Yeah. Actually, on the topic here of best of five and best of threes in general, uh, there was a question from Tim Lad 5105 Thank you for the question, by the way. Best of three, best of fives versus best of one. It's an age old question of professionalism in the leagues, but would it not wow. be better for the skill level of Western teams if they play more games, more trial and error with drafts, etc.? So, I mean, you bring up the BO5 and you bring up how it was a one sided respectful stomp from c9 respectful it would no nah, c9 i was trying to be nice really about it like, okay. 100 thieves did not oh. look like they had their heads on straight jojo was all chatting some he had some good stuff in there uh mm -hmm. throwing a, a quid you know I, I guess there was an interview afterwards where quid thought like jojo like didn't like him <laughs> they're like no no no, no <laughs> like, that's not the case okay <laughs> which is pretty funny uh but yeah, I mean, we've never, definitely as, you know, Western, uh, you know, people that talk about league, we've definitely never, ever seen this b about best of threes or best of fives versus best of ones. And, you know, it can help prep our team for internationals. Uh, I, I will say that a lot of people kind of like looked at 100 Thieves and like, oh, this team was indeed frauds. Like, because the scrim rumors are mm -hmm. that this team's not good in scrims. And that is substantiated by everyone. Um also, I know that like there was a weird scenario going into this where uh, River was sick, and I, I think that like I knew this because like, I had a team reach out or like while the games were going on, like a team reached out to me. I was like, "Yeah, like Under Thieves canceled this week. Uh, I guess like someone's sick," and I was like, "Oh, that's kind of a big deal, like going into playoffs. You know, like you don't have a full day of scrims." And it kind of came out after the series that. Yeah, River was sick. Like they scrimmed with the sub. Like they, you know, I had, they had a weird week of practice. And I, I, I mean, I'm kind of interested, like what Broxa thinks, because I mean, he is hands down the most experienced player on that team and one of the bigger voices. And when that person's under the weather, who is usually you know responsible for talking more, sometimes it's just hard to talk uh, when you're feeling bad. So uh, it looks like it had a really big impact on their play, especially in that series. It might have had a pretty big impact in some way. But yeah. I also don't think they should be allowed to make excuses. Like I when agree. I was in CL in 2020, um, I had some pretty massive uh, health issues um, that led to me barely being able to talk throughout all the playoffs. But we didn't go out and say like, hey, <laughs> one of our primary uh, shot callers literally cannot talk. We, uh, <laughs> you know, this is why we, we didn't win the split or whatever. Like, I think generally... All teams are going to have things that they're, they're struggling with at all times. And sure, it was a bit unfortunate for them that that River was a bit under the weather. But I actually did say on this broadcast or on this podcast, sorry, last week, that I thought C9 would have a pretty good chance of winning because for them in the regular split, they were really, really dominant every single early game. Like the early game stats was way better than all other teams. The only thing they were missing was playing properly mid and late. And... I think now they were able to bring the strong early game, but actually play like an actual team and utilizing their lead into something bigger. It's the same issue a lot of the teams in the LEC are having, just the West as a wall. Like any team can get an advantage, but nobody has any idea what to do when they're ahead. So every game just turns into a complete clown fiesta where you can flip yeah. a coin and, and that's the way you find out who's going to win. Like I, I think it's a pretty, pretty major issue. Um, and, and when it comes to like the best offs and, and playing more games and all that. I do think that in, in some way that could, could help finding consistency because like the, when you're a pro league player during the week, you have 20, 25 games of scrims, but then you have two free official games only. 
and you learn so much more from every official game than you do from a scrim because there's pressure there's something on the line people communicate differently play differently when when you know when the game actually matters and i think in an ideal world from a, a player point of view you should just do some online games that has an impact on standings like i don't care if you're only at the studio like twice a week but then you should also have two days where you just play a bunch of online games just play as much as possible really uh because that's the games that you learn the most from and i think the more games you can get all these teams to play that actually matter the better because it's not like they're just sitting at home <laughs> watching netflix like they're playing anyways so might as yeah. well get the most out of their practice i, I think there's two things to that I, I, firstly i think the thing that all of the teams are missing in mid game in, in europe is liking and subscribing to this podcast uh, if they did Absolutely that i'm pretty agree. sure their mid game could clean up <laughs> quite Big heavily true. <laughs> secondly um do you not think so I, I was trying to make the comparison to like a football league or a sports league, right? And obviously there's physical factors that mean that teams can't play as often in sports leagues, right? Because you, you're fatigued, your squad isn't big enough to like change out your 11 in English football, you know, every every uh, week. So you have to have a, a break so physically you can recover. But they, those teams play one game a week. If you're in Europe, maybe you play two games a week, right? Why do we not say, hey... Why don't football teams play five games a week? You know, there's the physical aspect, but they'll get better practice if they're in front of a crowd. Do you not think there's an argument that we talk about how scrims aren't good practice? Why don't we just make the te- like, why don't the teams just make the scrims better practice? Why do they not just take them more seriously? And I don't like, I don't have insight onto it, right? But in terms of saying we do not get enough good games, isn't there the simple solve of saying, hey guys, we can actually just give ourselves better games by practicing appropriately in scrims instead of what I always hear is a bloodbath, teams surrender at four minutes, they don't play out the game. Oh, if they're behind, they just give up. Like, why do we not... Well, why do I say we? I have no influence on this. I can't, as a fan, be like, hey, guys, play better in scrims, right? But why do they not invest more times into making sure that their scrims are actually appropriate practice compared to stage games? Obviously, there will never be a one-to-one comparison But I think at the moment, it seems like there is quite a large chasm between how teams play and practice in scrims and how stage games are performed. That definitely is an issue and something that in an ideal world should be solved. And I think there's certainly an element in both regions from my experience of having too many teams that are not taking practice seriously and that show up late and that cancel scrims and and whatever. But at the same time, even in traditional sports, players just feel differently about playing games that matter like it's something with with how you handle the pressure and you set your mind up to it and how you you got to get ready to perform and deal with all the people watching online etc and in league a average game time for a pro game is like i don't know 30 minutes or something if i watch a football game i'm gonna set aside like two hours to watch it and and that's a very long period where these guys are like physically drained mentally drained and all that and and for these league players it would be very easy to just get them to just play a lot more games uh during during the week and i think yeah you're right uh it, it would be ideal if the, the practice situation would change i don't think it's gonna happen uh you know it, it's just there's too many too many factors including um the fact that most of the players are like somewhere between 17 and 25 years old and they they, but they don't really approach sorry. it football they is don't approach it as a real job you know they don't have the exact but experience but then that's a manage- managerial, managerial problem boxer and like, i i, I the really do stuff i mean the I, world scrim champions yeah I, so i mean the g2 losing to nrg thing again there were rumors that all of g2 were sick that day they didn't use it as an excuse but whether they lost because they were sick whether they lost nrg over outperformed them on the day i want to stress that yeah nrg were the better team on the day g2 playing well in scrims maybe they would have been better if they you know had played against someone who wasn't energy maybe they disrespected their opponents on the day i don't think that matters too much and i don't want to make this a me versus broxer like broadcast versus the the pro player but i think it's nice to have the two points of view right because from a broadcast point of view why the fuck would i add a best of five of giant x versus i know uh, g2 uh, 
I, yeah, even Giant X versus G2, right? That's an hour of my broadcast time where 20,000 people will watch because they don't give a shit, right? Like, the G2 is going to win. Why am I going to watch a best of three of those? Why am I adding extra show days on a weekday when all it's going to do is bring my key KPIs down, my key performance indi indicators down? All it's going to do is bring my average minute audience down. All it's going to do is say, oh, you broadcast for 80 hours over the last month, but actually you only had an average of 20,000 viewers when I can just broadcast for 12 hours on a weekend and have an av average of 80,000 viewers sponsors are gonna look at that and be like holy moly 80,000 viewers 100,000 viewers let's fucking go whereas if they look at 20,000 viewers they're gonna be like what why on earth would I give you the money and also if you even if you have online games you still have to pay casters you still have to pay producers to produce them you still have to have people coming in on what now are their days off like my weekend is Thursday Friday right so if you put like games there, then how do we prep for those games? Is it just casters? Do you have an AD in there as well? What teams do you put on those games that just have these online games? Do you just upload the replays? That kind of reduces the the um, uh, the value of those games as well because you're not putting as much time into them. You're not having this big four around them, right? So it, it, I think the problem is, and this has always been the problem, is you will always have this two-sided coin right you have the broadcast and what they want from a kpi point of view and what riot wants from a kpi point of view and how they're going to make money and you have the players saying give us more stage games and the audience saying they'll be better internationally if you give them more stage games and you have to meet in the middle somehow which i think riot has started to try and do i don't think in the most successful way by introducing best of threes in playoffs but if the teams are not pulling their end what point do we call it like what point do we say hey guys we gave you three weeks of best of ones. Then you have best of threes and best of fives. Teams on average play 50% more games in our current format, but you're still not showing up to scrims and your players still don't treat it as a real job. At some point, it's a managerial problem rather than a broadcast problem. And these, like, these aren't all of my points of view, right? Like, I want to stress, I'm, this is more of a devil's advocate discussion from my side because I think we should have more best of threes. But from a broadcast side, from a riot side, I never see them saying, oh yeah, sure. Giant X versus G2, sure, we'll put that on a weekday. We'll just upload it online. 10,000 people will view it. Great, excellent, nice. I, I definitely see your point of view. And um, I, I also see how it can create broadcast problems and how it's tricky. Um, and I still stand by the fact that there should be more official games because it's always going to be way better practice than anything else you're given for somebody that hasn't been a pro player it might also be hard to relate to how different it is it's like going from playing in a five-man setting to playing solo queue like it's basically sure. the same like a scrim with zero um worries in life whatsoever and a professional game where everything matters it's an entirely different beast to deal with but you are also entirely correct that the professionalism is just not good enough. It's always been that way. Like when I started out playing both in the amateur leagues, but also in the LEC or EULC as it was called back then, I was mind blown by how unprofessional it was. Like it was unbelievable. Like it was so often that we, we went into a day and we wouldn't even be able to play five games. And sometimes we even had to be really mindful of how well we were playing like we we had this period where Fnatic was the best team in Europe and if we went up against certain teams if we completely slammed them three games in a row we knew with a 99% accuracy they were going to cancel the last two games like and and it's not any different now apparently it's yeah. the same story and i i think part of it definitely is you know lack of professionalism and accountability and i think uh it's something we briefly touched on last week as well how managers and coaches need to step it up and, and find more of a balance where players don't have so much control because i think that's just always been a problem like players have way too much control and you need somebody to be really firm and really strict and tell them like this is the way it is or you're freaking gone like you we're just gonna kick you uh but but that's not really happening right now because teams would rather have an unprofessional environment than you know try to build something in the long run like they're just trying to get the best the player that's going to be the best now instead of looking at how you can build a winning team in one or two years and i feel like that also just goes back to the topic that we were talking about earlier today where it's like esports it's just very quick 
and if you have X amount of years, like you're already considered old and veteran, and you should probably retire. Uh, oh, but thanks, Ginny. Yeah, okay. I'll fuck off then. I said you're right, considered. Yeah, I'll see you, I'll see I didn't you say you should. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, though, you'll just be doing the same thing as Brock said it. So nothing wrong with that. Uh, maybe you can do a career change too, but either way. I sorry, realized Brock, I was getting paid for this, straight. so I can't really just... Anyway. Wow. <laughs> well, uh, it's fine. Uh, anyway... Um, yes, this, is- this whole conversation is like starting off with the LCS and with uh, C9 particularly. We talked about 100 Thieves. There was something else, though, when it came to 100 Thieves specifically, um, and that was their fashion choices. <laughs> ah, yes. Ah, the, uh, the, the fashion the, choices. The Crocs, yeah. Uh, yeah you, if you guys want a, a trade secret of the LCS... Um, Please do. I'm pretty sure that... They didn't get fined for wearing Crocs. I, th- I think this is all a PR stunt, you know. If we if, if wow. we really like want to really? want to look into it, yeah. No, I so I, I actually worked at an event for uh, FlyQuest where it was for charity, and they're nice like guy. the biggest thing for uh, charity. Like if they raised 10k, they'd be like, hey, you know, like we'll like we, they were gonna match up to 5k. So if they raise 10k, like hey, we'll wear Crocs on stage, you know, and we'll eat the fines. And I, I was told behind the scenes, like, oh, yeah, we don't have to worry about the fines. Like, they changed the rules. Like, uh, they don't have to worry about it. So I think 100 Thieves are trying to make the biggest PR heist of all time, personally, saying that they were wearing open toes, uh, you know, shoes. Crocs are technically even open toes. Like, they just have holes in them. I mean, I, I, I don't yeah. know if it's safe for, for all, all things, you know. It's safe for gaming, Wait, at I, least. They, they've determined that. We're not fashionistas, so you put don't, your they, Crocs don't they have, in like, holes mode. on the toes? Do they not count as open? I mean, if your toes stick through those holes, I don't know why. I'm like, why, are, why are you getting so into the toes off. here, Jeannie? Please yeah. take them off. Like, <laughs> Wiki feet take them off. <laughs> them off. Put, your, put your Crocs in sports mode and, and you can go run a marathon. I personally don't find them the most comfortable, uh, but I don't think they're considered or should be considered um, open toe shoes. But again, that's just my own personal opinion. Well, I mean, uh, it depends so- which ones you wear, right? Because they have the ones that are just the strap at the front so that would be open toes but yeah, I, I think be. the big thing is you don't get fined for it right because 100 yeah. Thieves very explicitly said hey we're partnering with Crocs we're gonna get fined they're gonna pay they're all covering the fines. the fines that was the they're partnership co- oh that's such a heist man that's so shady if it's they're, true. they're taking all that's of the crazy. bank you know yeah that's like you gotta do what you gotta get do fined for uh, like me being like hey guys I'm really sorry. I swore on broadcast this week, and we get fined. Obviously, we don't get <laughs> fined. No one gets fined, for, but we get fined. So, can you guys help me raise uh, like five thousand euros? Because you know you should you know, buy my merch. I'm, it's it's to pay for the fines, guys. That's what? actually really funny because yesterday on the broadcast, I wanted to say what the fuck was that game about KC and SK, but then you I was can't. like, what the f- you have to, you have to have been, in, been in the show for three years before you get your first yeah. buck. Oh, yeah. so there, so I would get fined. Yeah, you were, yeah, but only right. by the other testers. You, you have to theory. buy us around. Yeah, Te- test it. Rock's like, test it. You need to throw your career down the you, toilet. It's okay. Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> let me know. Yeah, I mean, listen, you can say it once, right? Like, at, at, at the very least, you can say it once. But that's really interesting. Uh, that's a great PR stunt. Shout out to yeah. 100 Thieves. If it's true, like, that's... I mean, if, I don't know if, how if I feel it's about not it. true, it's an even better PR stunt because it's like... um. Nike paying Jordan's fines, right? Like Jordan, oh, yeah. when they first made the Air Jordans, you had to wear mm-hmm. four white shoes and they deliberately made them red and black and said, we'll pay every fine for every time you wear them. So it's a very sim- like, it's a similar analogy, right? Um, oh my God, maybe that's where he got the idea from. That's yeah, crazy. Quite, quite Sniper's trying to be next Jordan, you know, mm. starting with a Crocs deal. <laughs> what would you call them? <laughs> if you were going to make Sniper Crocs, what would you call them? The A Crocs? Because he likes a Crocs, right? <laughs> no. I don't know. Um, a Crocs? <laughs> the I'm the so Ajax so Renekton Crocs. just Wait, uh, mash up. Dear Nate Shot, I have thought of a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I would like 10% steak. That, that's, no, I don't. Uh, you uh, can put like, little charms on it. This goes out on YouTube, so. I mean, you I, can put I, little I, charms on it, and they could be League charms, and they could be like League of Legends themed Crocs. Honestly, you have I, to, if you use their IP, don't you have to pay League? Like, they don't give you their IP for much, so... There we go, collaboration. You're welcome. Uh, 10% stake, please. Uh, yeah. I'd appreciate that. I mean, regardless, I think that Mark has to put his foot down on this. Like, I, it's either fines or not, you know? We, we could have Mark C yeah. step up. Be, be big, big, big boy commission, you know? Big, Way down big the wall. boy commission. Come out Way down the wall. say something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little disappointed in 100 Thieves in that C9 series, though. Coming all the way yeah. back. Like, they... Oh, and, yeah. Even if River was sick, like, they got slapped. C9 they, looked good, uh, but, like, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
I think there was a lack of respect in draft for how well C9 lands. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those games didn't look very competitive early on. Uh, as yeah. like they just kind of got out of control. And I, I will give C9 props. Like I think they really did clean it up. Uh, but like even I think there are still like some holes. Like the first game, the TF, like I don't think they played some of the ports as clean as they could have, like for creating angles. I think that uh, like for some of the objective setups, they gave up their angles and porting in. Um I, and I like there's still some moments in mid game where like some of C9's rotations aren't as clean. I will say that Hundred Thieves and NRG, their map play is really messy. Uh, and if we talk about future matchups for LCS, I'm really concerned like about that. Like I Thieves against TL, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at least mine was a good segue, Jenny. Come on. I mean, no, mine was just it was supposed to be random. Like he's so we'll talk yeah. about them in the future. So I'm like like and subscribe because we're gonna be talking about them in the future true, because true. you know. LCS at this point, right? They're they're in the playoffs, so I think that makes their game significantly more interesting than the LEC games. Like, of course, we have the teams towards the bottom of the table that are absolutely shitting the bed that we'll talk about later. MGK. <laughs> wow, so uh, bless you. Uh, that are you know we'll talk about that later. But when we're looking at bad. the LCS right now, they are in the playoffs. So in terms of the matches that I would be one of watching this week, I would say Cubby is probably LCS related. Probably see if C9 is not washed. Maybe that wasn't a flash in the pan. Who knows? I said the yeah. word. Um, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know what you guys think about C9 versus Fly. I, I'm probably a little bit C9 favored, but I think like I don't know. We had I did the Hotline League the night before, and like we have people like trying to call in me like C9's not going to drop a game for the rest of the playoffs. And even Sven, he's like in the house right now, and he's like they're going to drop a game. <laughs> he's like I'm watching scrims. <laughs> they're going to drop games still. Um. I, I I don't know what you guys think. I I think like whoever wins that series does book a ticket to MSI. So, uh, but I, I think that Huge the series. first yeah I think the first uh team that's going to be on MSI is probably going to be C nine. Yeah, I mean I think I agree with that. I think C nine looked better than FlyQuest did in, in beating TL. FlyQuest still looked like they had quite a few errors, but I I think FlyQuest of the remaining teams are likely to give Cloud Nine the best challenge. I wouldn't be surprised if like finals is FlyQuest C nine as well. Yeah. Um. Yeah, your format works. Yeah, it can, yeah. Um, mostly because you, you have the experience on FlyQuest in the top side of the map, which means I don't think they'll be as easily broken up by Blabber. Uh, and then I also think they'll react well to the bot lane dives that C9 used a lot against 100 Thieves. Like, 100 Thieves really struggled because Meech was never allowed to play the game and Ayla was never allowed to play the game. And I really don't think that Whippo inspired and Jensen will let that happen to their bot lane to the same degree. Um, so I, w- I, I see FlyQuest taking a game. I'm going to go for the coward's answer, which is 3-1-C9. Uh, and then I could see finals going all five. Um, I, at the moment, I can't tell you who I'd give it to because we have to see how FlyQuest plays this week. But I wouldn't be surprised if FlyQuest do end up winning. Uh, but C9 will be the first team to MSI. I agree with you there, Cubby. Yeah, I'm on the same page as well. I think... I mean... Like Kobe mentioned, things are pretty pretty messy over there, even for, for C9. And I think in, in both E and NA, it's just hard to predict exactly what's going to happen because nobody is actually playing at like the, the highest, oh, highest no, level yet. Again. No, nobody <laughs> is making me comfortable going into MSI, sadly, but hopefully that's going to change in a week or two. Um, I would be surprised in this current moment if C9 doesn't actually win the split. I think there is a world in which... Uh, a fly quest or even a team liquid with the level they show, showed this past weekend could take them down um, I'm not sold on 100 views at all like as of right now in this current moment sure river was sick but they look like the typical uh, type of team that performs very well in regular season but then looks entirely different in playoffs when it actually matters and uh, maybe that's a bit harsh but so far they haven't really given me a reason to you know to, to think otherwise, but I uh, can give them the benefit of the doubt, I guess. No, you don't. You, you don't give any EU teams the benefit of the doubt. Stop giving other teams yeah, the benefit of the you doubt. Were literally flaming you can say all you EU. think they're Hold shit on. until they, they're a good Broxa. You can say that. Yeah. That's allowed. I, I have a pitch, Broxa. Uh, TL looked pretty good. I'm going to I'm gonna go out and say it. I think TL actually played some good league this week. Mm. Yawn was gaming. They did. Uh, uh, like the, I, I actually yeah, think but TL did they like, look good or did Yawn look good, right? Like that's. Like, I, I, I thought team? that uh, like they had a couple games. Obviously, they dropped. I mean, the FlyQuest game was... Let's just say that that set the LCS kill record uh, in a best-of-five series by 44. Uh, so it's kind of tough to say if that was a clean series or not. 
Yeah, uh, you guys are putting so, something in the water there. You had the wow. Saturday, Sunday, they, was it, no, Friday, Saturday series were fucking bangers, man. I they, mean, it's not like, like we're doing much better in the LEC, like... Oh, I loved run. watching them. I had a lot of fun. I want to stress I, that. It was just very bloody. I, I loved, like, the post-game interviews with, like, Busio and Masu, where, like, pretty much every answer, like, about the series is like, yeah, you know, it was just kind of a blur, and whoever won the last fight lost the next one because we fought so quick and no sums were up. <laughs> um, but I will say that, like, I, I think that what I really liked from TL is that it felt like uh, they, their, each of like, their side lanes were playing really strong, and I think that Core and Umti were playing pretty well off each other, Broxes. So that, I'm giving you a pass. It's your time to get excited about TL right now. Like, the, can they get Flyer Run for their money and maybe actually make it to MSI? No, I, I think everything kind of kind of came together for them. I mean, sure, there's still some flaws, but I think Impact, especially, but also Umti, have been pretty solid for for most of the split so far, despite the many losses. Um, Core has been a bit of a question mark, but like you said, he's starting to get more synergy with Umti, which is going to be really big for them in the long run. That team is kind of defined by the mid jungle support synergy, and then. Uh, the two newer players in, in AP and, and Jorn have been very questionable, to say the least, but it feels like both of them have started finding the, the footing. Jorn especially played really solid uh, this previous weekend. APA got a lot of flack for, for being too busy trash-talking in the first game against FlyQuest and not actually playing the game. But then, once he stopped all chatting, he started coming online with his Dignitas as well. Uh, did you so hear I, what I he's think... quick, sorry really quickly did you hear what he said around why he didn't say anything in the dignitas games it's so good no i i just know he said that he wouldn't Leaks. all chat at all and then they free out them That's yeah all so he, he typed glhf and the, he went on pros afterwards with sven and jat and uh, was it yon it was yon right mm -hmm. oh no ayla was it ayla no it, it, it was it was yon and apa it was yon yeah um yeah. and he said uh, Jack was like, why didn't you all chat? And he said, well, I didn't think Dignitas deserved it. <gasps> it oh my so god, let's good. go. <laughs> it was like, they didn't deserve my, my no, all but chat. Like, we were going to beat them anyway. I respect it more when players do that like ahead of the game and they're like yeah. chatting shit, you know? And then if it blows up in their faces, it does. But if it doesn't, great. Um, but yeah, great response. I like it. 10 out of 10. I mean, uh, I respect him sticking to it because <laughs> Jensen really murdered him like, I also can't believe it like the voice com comes out that Jensen is like you know why does this guy trash talk when he's this bad or I don't know what it was but yeah. <laughs> he actually just destroyed him entirely oh. Oh. TL they did a video where they put one of their video editors and one of their scrims against their challengers team and it was like, how would a gold player fare in like a scrim? And Jensen quote yeah. retweeted it. It was like, not too well <laughs> after the series. Oh, <laughs> Jen Jensen is on like an absolute heater this oh playoffs. My um, oh my God. I, I will say that like there, there was a lot of discussion around APA trash talking. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of curious like what you guys think, because I, I've been casting APA for like four years, like because he came up through our scene and like did collegiate and everything. So like there's a lot i felt like there was a lot of chatter around whether you should all chat or not uh and I, i'm kind of interested like what, what you think because jojo gets the pass because he's kicking everyone's butt right but like apa is going out there and like not playing as well as jojo so everyone's kind of like should he be all chatting right it's kind of interesting i definitely think it is partly because it's a bit unbelievable that the all chatting thing has started getting traction now and didn't six seven years ago like yeah. you know when i played on Fnatic and we had this huge rivalry with g2 in 2018 and 19 especially they were all chatting to the point where we actually blocked them like we, <laughs> wow. we had a rule during like a certain period where all five of us would block them so we couldn't see their messages like in lobby and in game because they were just perma all chatting and i'm gonna be honest like i think some of it can be can be like fun and it can be good banter. Ninety nine percent of you know the all chatting kind of thing is just really unprofessional, uh, in in my opinion. Like I've always had the philosophy that if you do it before the game, that's fun and all. But once you're in lobby and once you're in game, like it it doesn't really have a place there. Um, and then you can banter a bit afterwards, but that needs to be a bit more light because who cares when when the game is already over? But it's something that's been done a lot in the past and. I know it's a thing in football as well that people walk up to each other and trash talk to try to get mental advances right. And and I think 
it also really depends on how it's done, right? Like it, it, it really depends on on the moment and the specific example. Uh, I know as a player, you actually get um, trained in this. Like I remember a clear conversation we had with, I don't know if it was the LEC commission or a manager for the LEC, but he told us that you are, like we were mind blown by this, by the way. We were told that you're allowed to all chat as much as you want. You can say almost anything you want. The only area where they draw draw the line, or at least that back then, is if you type something toxic about an opponent. So let's say uh, I have Caps on my team, he lanes against Perks, and he kills him. I can't write Perks is bad, but if I type in all chat, bam, my mid laner is a god, he is so good. The second he gets that <laughs> kill, that's completely allowed. And I thought that was so, so crazy and ridiculous. Oh, man. Mental warfare. Yeah, yeah it really yeah. is. It's part of it. Yeah, I think I'm on the same page as Boxer here. Like, I really don't mind banter before a game. I actually think it can it can accelerate rivalries, it builds narratives. I think it's really interesting as long as it's not personal attacks. Like, you, you don't attack someone's family. You don't, do, you know, say anything like that. If you say someone's bad at the game, I think that's fine before the game. And then after the game, I think it should always come from the loser first. Like, I think if you, as a winner, are like, "Holy shit, I'm so good. These guys are so shit." You're just you're pushing someone's nose in the dirt, right? That feels very unprofessional mm -hmm. to me. During the game, I um, yeah, I would just mute all. I, I get really affected by it, so I just mute all at the start of the game, or mute the entire enemy team, and then they can say whatever the, whatever they want. I think I wouldn't do it uh, in the same way. I used to play cricket and rugby, and there's things like sledging there, where you're like deliberately trying to get in the minds of your opponents, and I never did that. I just praised my teammates. I was like, oh, really good, you know, etc. But I understand where it comes from, and I'm not gonna hold everyone to my like moral standards, right? Um, I would just mute all. I do in solo queue a lot of the time as well, unless I want my streams to you know be entertained by someone losing their mind, which <laughs> can be quite fun at times. Um, but yeah, I think before the game is fine. It goes both ways. After the game, I wait for the loser to do it and be like, "Hey, good game," and then fine, right? Like you just go from there. But putting someone's nose in the dirt after you beat them, I think, is just petty. You know, I, I've gotten baited by the, the producers at Worlds to trash talk once. I trash talked once in my career, and it wasn't even really trash talk. Oh, sure, but sure. I, now you was, walk it back. I still remember it. You fell it, victim Boxer. to the entertainment industry. <laughs> Let, let's, yeah. see, let's see. You got it in let's your see head. It's the one that you think you remember. Okay. So I'm thinking of Worlds 2020. We're about to play G2. It's a very important game because if we lose, we're most likely out of Worlds. And I tell this interviewer very clearly, like he really was, he kept baiting me for like 15 minutes. And I think I was like, okay, I'm just going to say it. I am better than Jankos. I'm going to destroy him and we are going to beat EU. And then, uh -oh. then we freaking lose, which uh, the worst part is we actually smashed them the game before. But then this game, right after I say this quote, we lose. He, he takes the quote at Yankos laughing like a literal maniac and it had like more than 20,000 likes and a billion retweets on Twitter and it was a, it was really bad like holy shit I'm, I'm glad it's the only time that I, I actually said anything like that and jinxed it Whew. but that doesn't, my, my inbox exploded that doesn't really sound like trash log just saying like I am better than the other person it's more like friendly banter like when I hear people say like oh trash talk I'm like thinking about people saying you know do something and then they add in game just so that it's like less toxic. You know, that's yeah, what I, I... I think if you said that in a, in a League of Legends right. game, a professional one, you wouldn't be allowed yeah. to play League of Legends That's what I'm thinking no, no, when no, you say like, trash talk. I, I, it's that like, is, like, that's crazy. <laughs> but it's like the friendly know. banter. Like, I agree with both is of you. Like, no, when you do say friendly banter, right, that's okay. Pre-game, yeah. it's fine. Mid-game, mind your own business. Stay in your lane, quite literally. And then, like, at the end of the game, I think it's fine. Like, I agree. Uh, but yeah. I, I wouldn't think that, that what you said there was trash talking. Like, I think it's pretty fun uh, for like from a viewer's perspective as well. It's like, oh, yeah, this guy, you know, is confident. He's he knows that he can do it. Like, this is really it, it adds hype to the match as well. Yeah, I mean, I think from a viewer perspective, like the LCS was like pipping in like the all chat overlay, like over the scoreboard. And I thought that was kind of fun, um, like regardless of like what we think of the guy's typing or not. I always find this one interesting because, like, again, I've I've known APA for a long time. Like, I've I've been casting for four years, and the very first match or like season I casted, like APA was playing an amateur at that point. Um, 
I know that, like, at least for him, I've always had the belief that he actually trash talks to hold himself accountable, which sounds weird, but, like, you know, it's like, you know, if he's going to go out and say stuff, then he's going to have to play up to it. And I think that, like, a lot of the reason why this blew up is because he wasn't. Um, mm-hmm. And so I always appreciate the, like, you know, whatever you think of his approach in the dig, like, he, pl- he played much better in that series because he didn't play well in the flight quest series. Like, Jensen was the MVP, and... I think if APA plays better in that series, then it could have very well have been C9 versus TL this upcoming week instead of TL like having to beat um, the dig and then going through the lower bracket. So um, I don't know. I've always had a different perspective on this for APA, and I, I think he does it to hold himself accountable. Uh, I think sometimes it can kind of take away from like what he does, but I find it kind of fun too. I think it is kind of fun. You just have to eat your humble pie, right? Like if yeah. I go out and I'm about to play boxer in a football match and I trash him the entire time, afterwards he has free reign. To yes. like be like, hey, look at this tweet. I beat you. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> and obviously within moderation, you know, as Ginny said, you're probably not going to say anything about doing something in game, right? But you, you have to eat it afterwards. I think part of the problem sometimes comes up is like how much abuse you get from fans afterwards. Like, I remember I used to be a huge EU over NA advocate and I still like I still get into it a little bit. But mm-hmm. if NA ever be EU, like people would come into my stream. I'd get messages and DMs. I flamed Gen G once. Like I, I, my um, line at the end of the BLG Gen G series at Last Worlds was, uh, "I was told it was the Church of Chovy, but what's a god to five non-believers?" And people that were like, was I can't believe you." That was such a good line. Yeah, I mean, that it's was a fucking line, so right? good. But I had I had Gen G fans in my mentions being like, "Why would you flame Gen G like this? You're so toxic, etc." Right? And that's not even banter. That's just like I'm just saying that your team lost. Um, yeah. So I can understand from a player point of view as well, like you just don't want to receive that, especially if it's against like a team that has fans known for being a little bit more boisterous, like TSM used to be a big one. You, If you said something bad about a TSM player, you closed your DMs for like a week just because you knew you were going to shit well, on Well, you don't me. have to worry about that anymore. Yeah, true. That's true. Uh, uh, but there are but teams it, like that that I'll deliberately yeah. avoid saying like outlandish stuff about just because i can't be asked with the fight anymore so yeah i mean in 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 his particular case he was also just unlucky that you know it was jensen that picked up on it because if it was a a rookie nobody would even like we wouldn't even know about it at this point but but yeah again you know i think anything before the match is great there's also some pros that have started doing schedule tweets well (laughs) yeah i love that that like don't mind me i'm busy dunking on this guy in bot lane or whatever like that's also pretty the thing with that is like you're accepting that it could go wrong like there's a tongue-in-cheekness of it which is why i love it because it's like if it's bad you've already been like hey i'm gonna eat my humble pie you've already accepted it i love tweets like that it's really funny i find them hilarious yeah. yeah, we had Jackie's last week on the LEC as well ahead of the BDS match and the interview go like, oh yeah, we're going to stomp BDS and I'm going to stay consistent. And then, you know, it was the other way around. GX got stomped. He didn't stay consistent, but he was he was really humble about it. He went out on Twitter and he was like, well, everything I said in the interview was wrong, didn't happen. We'll get him next time. And I think, you know, like, especially for Jackie's like being the rookie as well, I think it takes a lot of confidence to be able to say that. And I, I respect that a lot that he's he's done that. And again, I respect the fact that he came out afterwards and said, well, oopsie, you know, it happens. Uh, it was it was gr- good learning experience, but also yeah. nice to have a little bit of trash talk on the broadcast, especially um, on the LEC, which uh, speaking of the LEC, what the fuck is going on in the LEC, guys? Because like <laughs> we did not we did not. Well, we didn't want to put Fnatic G2 as the match of the week last week. And Kabi was like, mm-hmm. no, we should do that. And we mm-hmm. all just like ganged up on him. And we we're like, no, you don't know. Uh, you don't know LEC like that. You're not close with us like that. You don't G2 know that G2 is going to stomp Fnatic. I apologize. You were right, Kabi. Congratulations. I mean, I thought G2 was going to win. But I was like, oh, yeah, it's G2 Fnatic. You know, it's exciting. Yeah. Um, I think Fnatic had a really nice draft that game. Uh, I don't know. I was going through it, and it felt like between that and then, you know, Brox, it might be a good time to bring up that you thought that, uh, you know, Razork was deserving a first-team All-Pro and a winner, because I know this is spring, but also, I, I think uh, Razork had a pretty nice game. Uh, y- Yike definitely had a couple yeah. fumbles that really hurt, uh, kind of like transitioning to the mid-game. I think that just took all the wind out of G2 cells. Yeah, I think... I mean, Razork right now looks like... He's playing really I don't want to say by far the best jungler, but definitely the best jungler in, in the league currently. I think yeah. watching him a, a lot in spring so far, he also looks really flexible. Like, the way G2 drafted and played, I knew 
uh, you know, from from watching their games, exactly what they were gonna do. Fnatic has a lot of people hired to to you know be even more on point with everything and then predict every move, and and they were just one step ahead in in every single aspect. Like they knew they were gonna pick Lee and Ari. Mm-hmm. They grabbed Talia, they grabbed Poppy, and just counter it completely. And and then Rasorg and the Humanoid were just on an absolute rampage the entire game. And I think what makes Fnatic slightly different right now is that um, Rasok last year it felt like he was well even in winter actually he felt like a one man army that was just running around and desperately trying to make er- everything happen by himself but yeah. nobody e- ever allowed him to do anything and he would just look like a, a dirty inter dying on his own but now <laughs> people are actually following him and trusting his place and on G2 they're also a really good team but it feels like sometimes they're being carried a little bit by how good they are as individuals and sometimes in key moments they don't really come together and i think if Fnatic continue to play the same way we could get a little bit of what we saw in 2018 and 19 where these teams can both really push each other in in different ways and help level up the region as a whole and that's what i really hope to see like hopefully we'll we'll get to that point yeah, I actually think that's a really strong argument that Fnatic are the best team in the LEC right now. Um, they've only lost one game. It was against Heretics, and it's because they hard threw at a Gromp for no apparent reason. They really they didn't need to I mean, fight over it. I mean, it's a Gromp. What do you mean for I no mean, true, apparent on reason? Grump, it's a you know, Gromp. You have to fight for your god. Um, exactly. But yeah, I think apart from that, all of their games have looked super clean. G2, similarly, but then Fnatic won the matchup between the two of them, right? I think the only game of Fnatic that I thought while watching it was bad was the one that we cast yesterday, Boxer. Uh, their game against Vitality was super messy. Cool. Um, yeah, it, was, it was not a very... It's, not yeah. a, very it's a Monday thing. thing. It has to be. It might you know, be. You know what Vedi told me after our cast? Mm-hmm. He walked up to me and he's like, Broxa, as a caster, it is good to be honest and share your thoughts on teams. <laughs> but there's a certain line that we draw. <laughs> and I'm not saying that you walked over that line. <laughs> But you were as close as you possibly could have been. <laughs> yeah. The thing it's was, okay, I joined you on that side of the line. I was, like, so I was like, we're going. We're calling this a hoonie in. It's, you know. Oh, yeah, you um, went the ho, ho, holy. Uh, holo, 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 holy yeah. shit. Um, that was, uh, but yeah, like Vitality were just all over the place and Fnatic were too. But apart from that, I, I totally agree with you, Boxer. I think last, last split, Razork was the best slash the second best jungler in the league and the rest of his team seemed to be on fire and he was like he was really good at putting out fires and that's why he was the best and now it seems like Fnatic actually know how they want to play and they're playing really coordinated I would love to see another Fnatic G2 finals I'd love to see another 2018-2019 which is when Fnatic and G2 are constantly pushing each other to be better Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if we do see it Um, obviously G2 have had splits like this in the past though where They've just been developing stuff. They've just been working on things and they've been working on their mid game a lot. And then they come into playoffs and they just blow everyone out of the water, which is always a possibility. But Fnatic look clean enough right now that I think they uh, they could challenge G2. Uh, and I, I think they're probably the best team. In, uh, I'm not going to say probably. I think they're the best team in the league at the end of week two of, uh, yeah. of spring. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like, also the bar is low key on the floor. Like, I don't want, I don't like, listen, I don't want to talk about this, but I feel like we have to oh, really so talk nice. about some of the games that we've seen. I mean, you're talking about the Fnatic Vitality game. Do you want to talk about the KCSK game? Like, ha- no. do, I don't know if anyone had I- a look at the coach camps, but I really hope that, like, therapy or some sort of like help is involved because they were not having a good time i i also love how the week started off with like sk bds and like i watched that game and i'm like i I was like looking at like the result and the game and i'm like how does bds win this you know (laughs) and then sk end up ending the week against kc like that God, man. I oh, swear, swear, like if swear you though. if you took off the nameplates and some of these games showed up in front of me and I had to guess what rank it was from, uh, I would legitimately think it was Diamond the Low Master if we look just purely at macro decisions I, and not mechanics. Because yeah. that's what tilted me so much this weekend. Like I on the third day of watching it, I just couldn't anymore. And it, it's just the same thing for literally every team, even G2 and Fnatic. They get a really big lead in the early game. And then they just don't know what to do. Like, it, it's 
textbook League of Legends that when you have your lead, you come out of base, you set up some base vision, you push out lanes, you don't forget about side lanes, you push those out as well, you get vision on one side, you play find objective or turret, and everything is so simple and straightforward. Take but notes. right now, the meta is different. The meta is full NA RAM. We just freaking run it down mid, take a random fight, and hope for the best. And sometimes we win it, and sometimes we just randomly throw the game away and lose for literally no apparent reason. <laughs> like, it's it's so weird. I just don't understand how the players think this is okay and why the coaches think it's okay, how they, how they can look at this poor people having to witness I mean, this gameplay like 20, 25 games every week. Uh, the coaches aren't looking. Some of them literally close their eyes. Yeah, I, I don't think the coaches the think you're okay. <laughs> like, like, having watched like... Swiffer's reaction, I think he is very not happy <laughs> with how SK are playing at the moment. Uh, yeah, that I, was... Uh... I will say, Doss looked like he was smurfing in that game with some of those Renato alts. The, the, some of the Renato alts in the late game were absolutely, like, yeah. I was just watching Upset shred his entire team. It was so funny. Uh, yeah, yeah. Credit, like, the players are good like, players. I think that's I, the yeah, reason no, that I mean, the game, the game is a mess. me off, right? The game but is such I, a mess. It's like you watching a TL versus Fly, you know? I get to enjoy the shit show from this side of the pond. I'm, I'm like, tuned in, like, last night trying to catch up, and I'm like, wow, there was a week at LAC. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. Well, it, it, it's always so easy to look in from the outside and say they should have done this and that, and this mm -hmm. player shouldn't have been there and whatever. Um, I remember when I was on, on CLG in 2021, like, we would be in a similar situation where we were actually winning most of our early games but then in the mid and late game everything was a complete mess and we always lost in the end no matter what and it it's it can be different what issues you're having from from team to team our issue on that team was that everybody wanted to be the main voice like it's so many veterans everybody wanted to take control and if there's just like five ten seconds of doubt when you're going for a setup or where a call is being made like it can ruin the entire game you just need to be on the same page and that i think that's one of the issues that these teams are, are also having right now like they're just not on the same page and they're not thinking smartly about what play should actually be made and, and working together on, on achieving these little goals and games or to utilize the leads or to come back from when behind because I'm sure that if you sit these players down after a game and you ask them, what should you do at this moment? And what should you do at this moment? 90% of them would give you the correct answer. But when, when they're in it and they all five have to work together, it's just not happening. So I, like from your shoes, if you had to put on like a, like a coach Broxa hat, because you were talking about, you know, practice being more disciplined, uh, like earlier on, do you think this is something where it's like, for me, like practice, is like what you make of it, right? Like, I don't give a shit what G2 scrim, win rate is it's just like how much are you getting off off of like a playing the game and b going over it like is this something where you feel like teams need to be more disciplined about how they're going over stuff or like how they're drilling like mid-game decision making uh because like i i will say that new wall on top lane between both lcs and lec today or like this past week led to some of the most ridiculous mid-game scenarios or like over pushes for the top inner i've seen like i there were so many tp flanks like went up there that like either like I watched Whipple opt into a 3v5. I watched Hillisang TP up there to like make a play and like then like Vitality lost the game. Yeah, but like, also like, oh, actually, never like mind. <laughs> there was so much shit like like is this something where like, you know, teams just need to drill it more or like do you have a solution for this or I'm kind of interested. So some of these mistakes I think you could justify and get away with in the window split where nobody really knows each other and you're still finding your style and your identity cuz um, that, that each game obviously is different. Like let's say it's it's hugely different if your top laner is playing Cassandra or if it's a split push like Gwen or if it's a Rumble. Um, those are like three different scenarios of playing the game. But at this point, it feels like even though they've played together for, for months, they still haven't found the identity and clear way of how to approach the game. And I think sometimes if you're having these struggles in the mid game, you really just need to start from ground zero almost like take a step back figure out how each player should play in every game so everybody has clear responsibilities um, because if you know what your role is in every game it's really easy to, to practice that in scrims and then in every game when you're having this mid game issue you can identify like okay where did the problem lie? Was it the top laner that should have pushed out before we went for this dragon fight? Or was the jungler not there? Did he farm a little bit too much? Or 
or what exactly would it be but i think if everything is is kind of open and you just expect everybody to like you know fix it by themselves it's it's not really going to happen and i think it's the same when you improve as a solo queue player or improve with anything like you need to mm. identify the problem you need to find a very simple solution that you can easily work towards and then you can you can start improving al- along the way you're talking about like winter split and spring split right and winter split being that time where people haven't really figured each other's out everybody's still trying to figure out their own play style and then you move into spring and it's easier quote unquote to figure out teams and how they want to approach things and how they want to play out the game but i think when we're looking at mdk particularly would you say that is the main drawback in regards to them being in the literal finals of winter to literal bottom of the leaderboard I think for them to go from being as good as they were in winter, because I think they were actually really solid to being yeah. this bad, um, that there's two scenarios. One is that their egos couldn't handle playing so well in winter. It caught them off guard. They were surprised, and now they didn't come in as well prepared, and they're not trying as hard as they, they did then. Uh, so it, it could be an, an ego check. It could also be that, you know, that just having some some issues on the inside of the team or like there's some drama atmosphere problems i don't know but but like i think objectively like there's no way they should have fallen off as hard as they they have if mm-hmm. if everything functions perfectly fine because they looked so good in winter and they should definitely still be at worst the top four team but they just look completely miserable and they went from having uh, you know, everybody smiling and always being happy and, and having great times, even in losses and having really good team play to just being completely dysfunctional, both individually and as a team. It, it's pretty extreme. It did always seem quite a motivation and um, momentum driven team, right? Like that, it, when it's a bunch of friends in the way that it's, it's always been bandied around, um, I think you're always going to have problems when you start losing uh, unless you have a, a more stern voice that can like steer people back onto the right track. And I think for MDK, when they were winning, things went well. Everyone was on the same page. They synergized well. The Al- Alvaro and Elioia teamed up really well, probably our best, second yeah. best um, jungle support synergy in winter. And now they don't quite seem as coordinated. You can still see them going through the same motions, but that split second decision making doesn't quite seem to be there i wouldn't be surprised if they get it back um and if they like bounce back especially considering they should make it into playoffs with giant x and and rogue being pretty bad uh they should be able to at least sneak in um and then with playoffs i I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing as soon as they start winning again they actually keep that momentum going through the rest of the tournament speaking of giant x i wouldn't be surprised if that was the game that broke them because they beat sk then they lost to g2 like no way no way that could be like a big surprise or whatever but then in the third game they lost to giant x who is considered you know a bottom team alongside rogue and and i definitely think there's an element of you know having a, a difficulty handling losses like that's something i saw in a lot of the teams that i played for like no matter what team i've been on no one at the roster like Whenever you lose, it's a complete clown fiesta. Everybody is pretty harsh to each other. The atmosphere changes and you're trying to actively find solutions. Uh, you know, people are pointing fingers and blaming each other and all that. And I think in moments like that, you can either rebuild and become way stronger and really help each other, like get to a whole new level or everything just completely falls apart. Yeah, you're talking about blaming fingers. Well, bl- blaming fingers, pointing fingers and blaming each other. Um, there has been something, I, I don't know who we're going to be pointing fingers at and who we're going to be blaming, but I want to also talk a little bit about VCS particularly and the fact that that is an entire league that has just at this point been postponed, which to me brings the question, What's going on? Because I'm trying to understand the severity of the issue because I have obviously seen tweets online where people like, oh yeah, match fixing, match fixing here, match, match fixing there. And it, it, it and we've seen tweets about that around a lot, multiple leagues throughout the entirety of the year already. But for it to be this severe, that VCS just comes up and goes, we're chilling. You know, that that's concerning to a very big extent. I uh, Yeah, and I, I mean, I think the part where it's most relevant is that there could be a potential MSI spot either neutralized or up mm-hmm. for grabs between all of these regions so uh, like that I mean could have a big impact on what Riot decides to do there but 
Uh, I will say that there, the rumors are not good. And I have seen a clip where a team, everyone was dead. And instead mm -hmm. of ending, the team decided to go take the dragon. And everyone's saying that by doing this, they pushed the game time past 30 minutes. And that looks very incriminating uh, for match fixing evidence. And even the casters in that game were like shocked. Like, oh, we're just going to take a celebratory drink. You know, like I'm used <laughs> to fountain kills in, in my regions. Yeah. You know, we're like, we, we dive someone to try and get in a bonus kill and have fun. But um, yeah, it, it looked about as uh, bad as the, the Prime League clip that came out where like Jace forgot about his keyboard and mm -hmm. he, it doesn't look good. So the fact they took down well, the an entire league. league yeah, the Ultra League. Or not. Oh, that thank, was you, the thank you, thank you, thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, the fact they, like, shut down the entire league is very concerning for many reasons. Yeah, I, I mean, the thing is, like, it, it does look very suspicious, right? It, it's very mm -hmm. much like, who, who is among us in this sort of situation? I am interested to see how it will affect uh, MSI. Uh, they are in the VCS number one seed goes into play-ins. And mm -hmm. there's two groups in planes of four teams and they play against each other and the winners go through. So I wonder if we'll just see a team getting a bye through that. I doubt they'll invite a new team. Like every other time the BCS has missed has been like during 2020, they missed due to COVID or 21. Mm -hmm. And we just had a three team group. Uh, obviously the format was slightly different then. That's when we had the, uh, was it Peace going 808 versus RNG? Because they played That's like my proposal. Times bring the best oceanic team they, they combined it with pcs just bring him back you know yeah, yeah they're gonna the pull them out the of the best that. oceanic team got zero forward i know in in the pcs <laughs> but you know the what time EU they won were anything? fun they, they they talk some trash they had fun bring them back True. yeah, bring, yeah. Up, but it, bring up ground zero i mean yeah. bringing up like these msi conversations is that are we just assuming that this is it right like it's 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 done it's dusted goodbye uh, like, I don't think the whole league will go goodbye, but I don't yeah. think they can... Like, if, if you think there's been match-fixing on a level big enough to stop the league, I don't see how you continue the league in time to have a, an appropriate winner, at least by MSI, right? We have... Mm -hmm. MSI starts end of April, is it? So that's, like, less than a month. Oof. Like, how are you going to... Uh, it's more than a month, sorry. My maths is really bad. I was it's say, a month it, and, like, two weeks. Yeah. How, how on earth do you finish a whole league in a month and two weeks if you think... That you, you, you take Brock's as suggestion and you do like a game every day. True, actually, yeah. <laughs> Brox, Brox, can test it. It. <laughs> if they get more than a hundred thousand viewers, <laughs> Brox, I'm sure oh. the LEC will pick it and up. And they're gonna be so good at the game because they've had so much play that they're actually gonna beat Ooh, all of they're, us. They're gonna win and this they're gonna be like <laughs> <laughs> I, I think no, but it's a tricky one, right? Because it's like nobody really knows right now how how bad it is, but. If they start finding out that every single team had a match fix, so then it it turns into a bit oh of a bigger God. problem. Like then I I definitely don't think they're going to be at MSI. Even Worlds might be a question mark because they might have to you know rebuild the the entire structure and and find out how to prevent stuff like this from from happening mm -hmm. again. I also just think it's crazy that this is even a, a thing to begin with like that somebody is not satisfied by being a professional league player already but you know goes the extra miles so to get even more like it, it's just kind of mind-blowing to me and obviously when it comes to competition i mean even considering to cheat is pretty disgusting uh it sucks and you know we're on the jungle so i get to talk about the rumors that you know we don't know yet but the rumors are bad. Okay. It's like, you know, there are people like on every team a part of this like match fixing ring. Like Jesus. The, the rumors are really bad over there. So like the fact that they shut down the entire league, I mean, you, you got to believe like there, there's got to be something behind the rumors. Like there's always like there, there are already clips that are pretty incriminating of like certain teams. So like this, this could be like, um, this could be pretty wild. Like what, like the impact it has on the region, depending on like how deep this actually goes. So. Also, oh, that brings the question in regards of like how do you handle it going forward? Because if you if like the rumors that you're currently like throwing out at us, you're spilling the piping hot tea, saying that every team was involved. If that turns out to be the case, what do you do? Do you just like yeet every team? Well, I think it depends on is it a player on every team that's involved or is it the team? Yeah. Right. Because if yeah. a player on every team's involved, it's similar to the LDL in the past where they like they target banned a bunch of players, right? I mean, there's, I can't remember the full list, but Bo was one of them. He had to mm -hmm. take a, a year and a half out before he was able to join the LEC. 
he's I don't think he's allowed to play in China. Uh, I don't think he's allowed to go back to the LPL. So you can do that and you can target ban every player. And it, uh, that's probably more likely just if you think about how a cheating scandal would work. It's a lot easier to get one player from every team than it is to say, okay, every team we're going to specifically... And also it's a lot easier to hide it if you do that. Because if every team is agreed on it, it's like, okay, guys... Let's make sure you get five kills before the five minute mark, but then we need 10 kills by the 10 minute mark, you know? Um, so likely the investigation will end up with a bunch of players being banned and then they'll just go back uh, into it. But uh, it, usually it takes a couple of months before things get rectified in this sort of place. And just back to your point, Boxer, about why would you do it? I think we are quite privileged in how much money we can make from esports and the position we're in. Um, for Vietnamese players or players in the VCS, the pay isn't great. It was similar in the LDL where they, were, they weren't making a lot of money. So I think the main incentive is financial. And if you're trying to support yourself, and especially if you're trying to do a job where uh, maybe your family doesn't support you that much or you're trying to support your family. like I'm not saying it is an appropriate way of doing that. I'm saying that is likely the motivation. And I can kind of understand it from their point of view. I don't agree with it, but I understand why someone would do it in this sort of scenario. I also understand it to a certain extent, but at the same time, you've been grinding for so many years to even yeah. get to this point at where if you can actually perform really well and consistently, you have the chance to get picked up by a different region like yeah. the LPL, and then things are going to snowball completely out of control. So it's just, you know, risk versus reward. That's that's hard for me to comprehend. Yeah. But like you're saying, we're also in a very different scenario over here, so it's, it's hard for, for any of us to be able to fully understand what's what's going through their minds. I, I think the most interesting thing is if it goes up the chain and like you have any like coaches or owners that are involved in this because like yeah. that was the rumor with LDL in the past that like you know like a player like Bo was forced to match fix right like then or like I know that like there have been rumors in the past where like you know people up top are like you have to do this and this isn't yeah. just for league too like for CS:GO there are like there was a whole like ring of like I buy power wasn't it was it I buy power. I feel like I them. potentially, but like there was like someone pretty much like I just remember this like giant graph that people made talking about like how some people owned the gambling sites, teams, and the tournament organized like the tournaments itself, mm -hmm. right? And it was like a really big conflict of interest. So I like in that case, like I would feel really bad if players like you know from mm -hmm. who were living out the dream, like were told by their upper management, like you have to have five kills in this game by 10 minutes, right? Like that'd be. That is a situation that has happened before in our space and is equally like brutal. So I to see like how far reaching this is, like from what I've seen so far, it's hard to say that like there's nothing there, right? Uh so yeah. But then to me that brings the question is like, okay, if you're told that by upper management, would the blame still fall on the player? Because this management person, individual, can then go to a different team and do it again. So What's the fix to that? How how do you deal with management being involved in this? Because that's that's you a whole them. different ballgame. Yeah, you ban the management. Yeah, yeah. but like the, the, then the question like, is like, do the players take that blame as well? Right? Yeah, exactly. And that, that that's tough. Yeah, that could get really interesting. Yeah. That's a like maybe a player gets a slap on the wrist suspension. Like it's like oh you're suspended for three months, but the league actually isn't going on for three months, so you can't <laughs> professionally. Like it happens a lot in. Um, in like rugby and such where at least it did in the past where if you didn't think it was actually a player's fault you'd ban him from playing professional rugby but it would be like during the off season so it's like oh wait you you can't train with your team but we're also not going to be at the training pitch every time so if you want to go and you know watch your team train or train a little bit that's kind of okay uh, and then they had to start introducing cards that actually went over to the next season uh, to make sure people couldn't play in the next season but yeah i think it, you ban management and then you slap on the wrist of the player depending on how how much the player agreed to it right because if you're going to ban management you have the records or whatever they did you probably have like emails and such and if the player seems reticent then you give him less of a ban but if he doesn't seem reticent, reticent then you, know, you give them more of a ban it, it ends up being many shades of gray um but you have to find probably a stricter hand to make sure it doesn't happen again in the future no what a light topic to end like uh, and subscribe what a light topic to end the <laughs> podcast with i think we've already kind of discussed in terms of like uh fly going up against c9 being the match of the week that's something you guys have to watch but i want to look at the lec particularly is there a matchup that we think like is going to be interesting whether it's literally going to be a clown fiesta running it down solo queue style or like actual good gameplay um 
I, I just want to say, like, from my less educated point of view, I'm excited for MDK Heretics. I think that it's going to be really important that, like, Mad can pick up a, a win early in the week. I, yeah. One of my favorite parts about being a part of this is that I've been watching more LEC, and to this day, I love watching Yankos play League of Legends. I, this guy sees the game differently <laughs> and is so good. Um, and I, I thought he played like the Jarvan was really big this last week for him. Uh, and what was it, the SK series where they ended up bouncing back? SK just had wild games across the board this week. Jesus. Yeah, um, I mean, talking I, as that, well about like the wild games, Smolder yeah. was like a big part of it. And yeah. we have a question actually from Downright Disturbed who talks about, I truly believe the league should not have executes on champs and items. It is never enjoyable to be killed by something that removes the skill of playing with low health. It effectively permanently reduces your health to execute range. As an AD carry player, I want to say that it doesn't matter because you're going to get one shot anyway. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I, I think that I like executes when used appropriately. I think Pike is a great example where it's, he has to skill shot you to execute you, and it's a, it's an integral part of his kit. And his kit is built around the power budget is built around him being able to do this. I don't like collector. I think collector's giga boring because like it's just like oh I died before I thought I would die, and I don't like smolder execute. Uh, I think elder dragon execute is fine because it's such a big objective that you have to play around. It's not just a I bought it so now I have it sort of thing. Um, but other, I mean, are there other ex executes in the game? Like, I mean, Elder Drake is like an execute for the whole thing. Yeah, I, I like Elder because that's a big like fight Elder. that you have to have. And there are some things that like do execute damage as in they do higher percentage missing health damage. So like the more health you're missing, the more damage yeah. they do, which I think is like Vigar ult, for example. You can talk about how Vigar ult is not a very fun button to play against, but I don't I think it's imbalanced. Uh, I think having a burn that also executes feels really unfair and i don't like collector because it also just seems to come out of nowhere right like it's just like oh he ordered me and usually i'd be higher health but this time i'm dead um uh, so yeah honestly if uh opponent builds collector and i have the execute bar going up against it that would be kind of nice um yeah actually i wouldn't mind having a little bar. yeah Although the bar nice. does, it plays on my fucking mind, man. Like, as, <laughs> yeah. whenever I play against a smolder, we can be like 10k gold up, and I'm like, okay, hey, we're gonna win, we're gonna win. And then I see the bar, and I'm like, I have less health now. It just, in my head, it changes the way I think about the game. It really frustrates me, because it shouldn't. I should still just play the game the same way with like a little bit more reticence about going all in when I'm at 10% HP. But yeah. Just that visual the, indicator really changes how I think about League. You see the bar and you're reminded that little dragon's a fucking terror. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's so, so small and that's so much. Like, yeah. why? I mean, at least like this time on the LEC, I feel like this week it wasn't too crazy. We've also like seen like G G2 had Smolder and shat the bed. So, you know, we take those. Yeah, I mean, the hotfix nurse really did yeah. hit him quite hard, which is nice. I, he's like playable, but not overpowered overpowered yeah. he's still strong on 40 and 5 hotfix 40 and 6 he's going to be really weak i think so i'm quite happy to to be moving there and when we talked about him in the past it was a yumi situation right he's either okay in solo queue and really powerful in pro or he has to be really bad in both and i think that put him into a position where he's going to be relatively bad in both at least i, I think that's the problem with this champion it's just going to be hard for them to balance at least yeah. while the the execute is as easy to use as it is. Like if it changes to a skill shot or something, so it actually requires, you know, more than than just having your hands yep. on your on your mouse to, and keyboard to actually land it, then that changes things. But right now it's just it's too easy to utilize. I have an idea. Okay. You keep oh, the no. burn and you have to hit enemies with Q over the amount of stacks, but then they only execute if you hit them with the middle of your ult. So but you can maybe you increase the execute threshold. So it's like a higher execute and it's like, okay, you can have the burn and you can have the extra ticking damage, but to kill them, you actually have to be able to hit them with this line skill shot. That I would feel like there, I'd be like, okay, yeah, cool. He outplayed me. You know, I, I burned all my dashes. I had no way of getting out of this. I didn't have a way of popping a shield before the ult came down. Cool. You got me right in a similar way to Pike. I'm like, cool. You got me. You know, that happens. Not just, uh, Hey, you press Q with rapid fire can. Now I'm dead. <laughs> Sweet. Kind of. Like similar line to that, I actually would prefer if the execute was only on who you queued and not the bounce. Like if the bounce was only the damage. Oh yes, because that yeah. like I, there was a clip oh. in the TL hundred or no the the TL series like no it was it was enter whatever the fuck the clip was. I saw Yawn get two kills like two screens away, 
because he queued and like they flashed and he just got a double cut. I'm like, wow, this champ's bullshit, right? Yeah. I so I think like if they took it off on the bounce, that would actually help a lot because it the pressure it applies on carries is it's filthy. It's so filthy. Yeah. The fact you can have the execute on five players at once yeah. is just it just feels so unfair. Yeah. Anyway. Now that Brock is just sitting there and smiling, but I, I want to know your opinion, particularly about executes in the game. I think it it's really depends on how, how they're put into the game. I think generally right now, League already has a problem where there's too much burst in the game. Like, a, you know, a while ago, they brought a durability patch, which was meant to extend fights and bring more skill expression. Now whatever is left of that the durability patch i don't know i don't i think any changes they made back then are gone because now it's just you you have to one shot somebody before they one shot you and i think uh you know having stuff like executes kind of buys into that philosophy of just having as much burst damage and one shot potential as possible mm -hmm. um and and i think i think the the burst is a problem i think executes can be okay if if the meta is a little bit differently but like right now even without executes involved like i, I can be in my jungle and i can build support appears out of nowhere and literally hundreds of zeros me without me having any counterplay because that's how much burst damage there's in the game you add executes on top of that well holy i don't even know how i'm supposed to play the game at that point right so so i think um it's 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 a tricky tricky thing to balance generally, but I think overall champions should just be tankier, and then it wouldn't be as as big of a problem. Yeah, give everybody more HP, keep the burst. Uh, sounds great. Eighty like carries would still die in one shot. I'm just gonna yeah, put it out there. Yeah, that's, that's kind <laughs> of like what dead. I was thinking about. I'm like, hmm, every, as, if, as an eighty carry player, you'll still die. We get smolder. We get like something broken for like a week, and then everybody's like crying about it. I, Understandably so. That shit was busted. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate the thoughts and opinions and emotions that were shared today. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you to everyone as well for tuning in. Make sure that you like and subscribe and also leave any questions you have down below. We will answer your questions. That's a promise, just like we've done today. Hope you guys take care of yourselves and we're going to see you next week. Bye. Bye.